Good morning, and welcome to the 165th Landon Lecture on Public Affairs. The Landon Lectures began in 1966 by the late Governor Alf Landon and the late K-State President James McCain. The goal of the Landon Lectures is to bring the most prominent thought leaders to Kansas State University to discuss the pressing issues of the day. We are very pleased today to welcome the Honorable Tom Donilon to the Landon Podium to join 164 predecessors in bringing their thoughts and opinions on important public issues. This time, I'd like to introduce several folks in the audience and ask that they please stand, uh, please hold your applause. Dr. April Mason, Provost, Dr. Jackie Hartman, Chairperson of the Landon Lecture Series and Chief of Staff in the Office of the President, Mr. Edward Seaton, Chair of the Landon Patrons and Editor-in-Chief and Publisher of the Manhattan Mercury, Dr. Dave Rintoul, President-Elect, Faculty Senate and Associate Director of the Division of Biology, Jan Taggart, President, Classified Senate, and Reagan Kays, K-State Student Body President and Senior in Agribusiness. Please join me in thanking these folks for being here today. Mr. Donlan served as National Security Advisor to President Barack Obama from 2010 to 2013. He was involved with the administration's counterterrorism strategy, including the operation that eliminated Osama bin Laden, helped design and implement the Asia Rebalance Strategy, helped shape decisions about the Arab Spring, helped manage relations with Pakistan, Israel, Saudi Arabia, and Russia, and was deeply involved in U.S. strategy vis-a-vis -vis Iran. Mr. Donlan's first position in the White House was in 1977, working with former President Jimmy Carter. During the Clinton administration, he served as Assistant Secretary of State and Chief of Staff at the U.S. Department of State. While there, he was responsible for the development of and practice of the department's policy initiatives, including the NATO expansion, the Dayton Peace Accords, and the Middle East process. Mr. Donilon is a distinguished fellow at the Council on Foreign Relations and a non-resident senior fellow at Harvard Kennedy Belfer Center for Science and International Affairs. He also received numerous awards, including the Secretary's Distinguished Service Award from the State Department. Please help give me a warm welcome to Mr. Tom Donlin to the Landon Lecture Podium. Thank you. Tom, thank you. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, President, for that kind introduction. And uh, thanks to all the students, uh, faculty, and members of the Kansas State uh, community for having me here today. I especially want to thank uh, and acknowledge uh, Dr. Jackie Hartman, who oversees this Distinguished Series. Thank, thank you, Jackie, for all that you do. And I am uh, really honored to speak here from this uh, same podium as many of our nation's most mo notable public servants, including presidents, military leaders, members of Congress. The Landon Lecture Series, now in its 49th year, is a wonderful tradition that provides an opportunity for leaders to take some time and to reflect on their experiences and the nation's challenges and opportunities, and frankly, to do so in such a terrific and civil environment as, as Kansas State. My first trip to Manhattan was under different circumstances, as best I can remember. I came here 30, some 33 years ago to be in the wedding of my dear friends, uh, Dan Bowen and Ed, uh, Ellen Sulzer. Uh, that was back when Jackie's father was making Kansas State basketball history. Uh, it was a great occasion. I also, uh, on that occasion, met Edward Seaton, the publisher of the Manhattan Mercury. I was thinking about this last night. Edward and I and others had, had dinner, and I was thinking about that even, I, I, was, I was kind of proud of myself that even that early in my career, Edward, I had realized the value of spending time with the local media moguls. So it's, uh, <laughs> uh, really, uh, so it's great to see you again here, uh, here today. Uh, and it's fitting uh, that we gather here to honor the legacy of Governor Alf Landon, who embodied the best traditions of public service here in Kansas and across the nation. He once humbly described himself as, quote, an oil man who never made a million, a lawyer who never had a case, and a politician who carried only Maine and Vermont. Of course, the rest of us remember him for his leadership and his advocacy of American engagement in the world, and his, and his daughter, Senator Nancy Kasselman Baker, and the rest of the Landon family continue that legacy of service uh, today. Uh, it's a special privilege to speak uh, here to such a talented group of young men and women who are trying to find their places in the world. Uh, I'm going to talk today about the topic of American declinism, uh, which is a hot topic these days uh, uh, in Washington, around the country, and around the world. I do a lot of traveling around the world, and you hear that today, and I want to address it uh, uh, quite directly with you here today. Young people today are used to hearing a pessimistic story about the country's future. As you're, you know, and, and, and we're well aware of the challenges we face. The, 
the worst of an economic crisis behind us, but too many of our fellow citizens are still struggling to, hind, to find work. We face long-term deficits in debt. Our elementary and high schools have slipped down international rankings. Our infrastructure needs re rebuilding. And there are real concerns about whether our increasingly technologically advanced and globalized economy can produce good jobs for Americans into the future. There's also a broader pessimist than we hear about America's place in the world. As National Security Advisor to President Obama for almost five years, I spent the vast majority of my time in government coordinating the U.S. foreign policy responses to crises and challenges, from winding down the war in Iraq to addressing uprisings in the Arab world, from North Korea's provocations to our constant efforts to protect the country and defeat al-Qaeda. And sometimes it seemed like all we were doing is putting out fires. That's all we had time for. And during those challenging moments, we would often hear that America's influence wasn't what it used to be, that our days as a leading superpower were numbered, and that the United States is no longer capable or willing to take on the global challenges of the day. I, I came here today to reject that view. Uh, and today I'd like to discuss with you why, in my judgment, America is not in decline, but will continue to be the world's leading and most powerful nation for a long time to come. I arrive at this assessment fully aware of the threats our nations face. I spent much of the last five years in some very dark places, battling those who would do us harm. And I am fully aware of the strengths of our international competitors, embodied in the extraordinary rise of the rest, as they say, one of the most consequential trends in world economic history. But I remain unflinchingly optimistic about America's position. The fact is that no nation can match our comprehensive, multidimensional set of enduring strengths, bountiful resources, both human and material, our global network of alliances, our unmatched military strength, our entrepreneurship and innovation, our liberal uh, political and economic traditions, our remarkable capacity for self-assessment and rejuvenation. And frankly, I am more confident today about America's prospects than I was as a 22-year-old walking into the White House almost 37 years ago for the first time. I recently came across the following assessment, and I quote, the United States cannot afford another decline like that which has characterized the past decade and a half. Our only self-delusion can keep us from admitting our decline to ourselves. Now, that familiar line of argument could come from today's opinion pages, but in fact, those words were written over 50 years ago, in 1961, by a young guy at Harvard named Henry Kissinger. The story shows that all our optimism, uh, that for all our optimism, America has always worried about our place in the world. It's in our DNA to always ask ourselves, are we the best? Can we be better? And frankly, it helps us to drive our renewal. To borrow from the great political scientist Samuel Huntington, quote, the United States is unlikely to decline so long as it, 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 its public is periodically convinced that it's about to decline. The, de the declinists play an indispensable role in preventing what they are predicting. Now, Dr. Kissinger had valid concerns. At the same time, at the time he wrote those words, the U.S. economy was struggling to grow its way out of a recession. The Soviet Union had launch, launched the, first world's, the world's first artificial satellite Sputnik into orbit. <clears throat> The nation went into a panic thinking that we had fallen behind in technological innovation and would soon be outspent and outmatched by Moscow. And yet the de decade and a half that was the subject of Dr. Kissinger's worst fears, the period from the end of World War II until the Kennedy administration, is now seen by most historians as an era of unparalleled economic growth and power. The decade that followed was even more prosperous, ending with the United States, not the Soviet Union, making the first lunar landing. De uh, None of this is new. Uh, just in my lifetime, and a lot of our lifetimes here, uh, every 10 years or so, we have a new uh, bout of profound pessimism that sweeps, that sweeps the nation. In his fine new book, The Myth of America's Decline, the German journalist and author Joseph Jaffe documents roughly five waves of declinism from the time Sputnik went into offer till, today's, uh, till today. And let's go through it decade by decade. Declinists in the 60s asserted that the cost of Vietnam and the social and racial tensions would bring about what one prominent historian called the unraveling of America. In the 1970s, decline has signaled the end by pointing to inflation, oil shocks, and unemployment. An ally fell in Iran, and the Soviet Union invaded Afghanistan. In the 1980s, we feared Japan's growing economic strength, and historians would say that we would, be, we would soon become one of history's forgotten empires. But in each instance, the sky didn't fall, the United States didn't sink into the ocean, and we're still here, the most prominent nation on Earth. I think this shows that there's a tendency to underestimate America's staying power, its enduring strengths, which I want to talk about today, but also the need to be humble about our ability to predict the future with any precision. Now today, the declinists are back, arguing that China will soon overtake us, 
or that our gridlock politics, long-term deficit and decaying infrastructure will prevent us from playing the same global role that we've played since World War II. And I take these uh, concerns seriously. And we should not assume that America will retain its primacy simply because the, decline, the declines have been wrong in the past. Leadership is not something the United States has by happenstance. It's something that has to, we have to earn over and over again. How do you actually quantify power? A predecessor of mine as National Security Advisor and one of the finest minds on foreign policy is a big name, Brzezinski, recently assigned the United States a strategic balance sheet of assets and liabilities, like you would in any business. And I think his framework sets up a useful way of analyzing where we stand today. And indeed, in his book, Strategic Vision, he actually has a page where he sets out assets and liabilities like you would in a business balance sheet. How do we quantify this power? Uh, now, and he talks about exactly what the, what the assets and liabilities are, and I want to talk about that balance sheet today. Now, we certainly have strategic liabilities we can't ignore, but what is sometimes lost in the periodic wringing of hands is how extraordinary America's assets are. First and foremost, our ability to deal with whatever challenges come our way. Measuring power in today's globalized world is a complex task. A country's strength and influence goes beyond the old one-dimensional quantifiers that we used to use, like steel outputs and troop numbers. And while our military might is tremendous and essential, power today is more often exercised through economic vitality, the capacity for innovation, a vibrant, stable political system, and a resilient society. It is not measuring strength in one or two dimensions that captures a country's true position, but rather the accumulation and the interaction of all these assets. So today I'd like to talk to you about five of those assets, five unique and enduring strengths that are the foundation of America's leadership in the world. Our economy, our military might, our geography, our people, and our leadership. First, the economy. More than anything else, the American economy is the wellspring of our global leadership. There, aren't not a, there are not a lot of iron laws in history, but one of them is that a nation's power is directly related to its economic strength. President Obama said in, in a speech at West Point several years ago that no nation has been able to maintain its political and military primacy without maintaining its economic vitality. Now, the 2008 financial crisis tested our resilience, dealt a real blow to our national prestige and authority, and long-term challenges remain. But the fact is that no country comes close to matching our fundamental economic strength. The United States is built on a strong structural foundation combining entrepreneurial orientation, deep and efficient capital markets, highly experienced managers, and strong technological leadership. By every measure, the United States has the largest economy in the world today, generating nearly $17 trillion in GDP. Our economy is double the size of the second largest, China's, and our stock market is five times bigger than China's. We lead the world in attracting foreign investment, and we're also the world's largest single investing economy. An economy's most important asset is not its sheer size, and that I think is really important to underscore. China's enormous population base will some, at some point put it on a path to become, or will put it on a path to become the largest economy at some point in the future. But history shows that size alone has not been the most important factor in determining the most powerful nation. At the peak of Great Britain's global power, it was China that had the world's largest economy, even though the country was in a middling power in the throes of what China refers to as their century of humiliation. As opposed to size, I'd argue that a far better measure of an economy's health is its quality and sustainability. We have the wealthiest large economy in the world, as well as the most diversified and technologically advanced. By way of comparison, China has a very large economy, but a very poor one, a very poor economy. The United States income per person is more than $50,000, whereas China stands at about $6,000. That provides, I think, an important perspective. Now, and when we look, for, uh, we look for our prospects in the future, it's true that the United States is in a position to maintain its leading position. I'd like to talk about three elements of our economic strength. Innovation, energy, and higher education. First, innovation. Apple, Google, Facebook, Twitter are all synonymous with American economic vitality, but only one of those companies existed 15 years ago. The largest eight technology companies in the world by market capitalization are based in the United States. And when it comes to the next frontiers in extraordinary breakout technology, 3D manufacturing, artificial intelligence, nanotechnology, cloud computing, robotics, big data, advanced material sciences, Entrepreneurs and companies are, and universities are leading the way. We also lead the world in research and development with a projected $465 billion in spending this year. That's 30% of all global uh, R&D. Now, like so many of our strengths, and this is a point I want to stress today, our innovation advantage did not happen by accident. It stems from a combination of a risk-taking culture, 
significant investment by the American government in research, which I want to come back to because it's absolutely a critical part of the American system, the best universities in the world churning out good ideas, and the kind of regulations and easy access to capital that make it possible to turn ideas into businesses. And all those strengths come together in places like Silicon Valley, which represent to the world our spirit, our spirit of creativity. I recently spent uh, some time in Silicon Valley. I went to one venture capitalist office, prominent venture capitalist, who told me that he had seen 3,000 ideas presented to him in a one-year period. The, 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 the speed of innovation and ideas and the way it comes together, again, to take ideas and turn them into businesses, very cheaply right now, by the way. It's never been cheaper to build a business in the United States than it is today. It's really extraordinary. A second and, frankly, unexpected U.S. economic asset is our national energy outlook. For most of the past 40 years, the United States thought of itself as a nation dependent on oil and energy-related events beyond our shores. Now, U.S. innovation and technology allow us to tap unconventional sources, and, nearly, and, and every, nearly every prediction about our energy future has been turned uh, on its head. Today, Again, completely, when I came into office with President Obama in 2009, I, we were briefed by the various intelligence and ec economic services, they'd come in, and said, in five years, the United States is going to have to double its import of natural gas in the United States. That, that was the prediction we were presented with. Completely turned on its head in a five-year period. And today, the United States is the number one producer of natural gas in the world, and the price of natural gas here is a fraction of what it is elsewhere in the world. The International Energy Agency projects that we'll be the largest producer of oil by the end of the decade, and unconventional energy will propel our economy and support American jobs. Nearly 900,000 net by next year will come just from shale gas. Meanwhile, our new energy security is allowing us to engage the world from a, th from a position of strength. It gives us latitude to support allies and, if need be, to punish adversaries. The success of our Iran sanctions effort, for example, was made possible because we were confident that increased American supply enabled us to afford removing one million barrels of Iranian oil off the market each day without increasing gasoline costs to U.S. consumers. And you can imagine the conversations that took place in the Situation Room in the White House when we were considering putting these very intensive sanctions on Iran and the questions were arose, what's this going to mean in terms of the U.S. consumers? And we had a lot of confidence at that point, given our increase in oil production, that we would be able to handle that, and that's what happened. And it was the bite of those sanctions that ultimately brought the Iranians to the negotiating table uh, last year. Now, like our success in innovation, this energy renaissance did not happen by accident or because of luck. It is truly an only in the U.S. story. Many other countries have promising shale deposits, and many may have far greater deposits than the United States does. But the reason the United States has seen such dramatic and fast-paced energy changes is because decades ago we made wise, significant investments in key technologies, and we have the right balance of an open investment climate, an innovative entrepreneurial spirit, environmental safeguards, infrastructure and property ownership rights. And today, the wide availability of cheap gas in the United States has become a major competitive advantage for our industry-intensive manufacturers, particularly when compared to Europe and China. And meanwhile, our reduction in energy imports has brought our trade deficit to a four-year low and allows a greater share of that money Americans would spend on energy to remain uh, in America. We also now have the opportunity for both the export of natural gas and crude oil to the world, which will allow us to support our allies, stabilize the world's energy supply, and expand our own prosperity. Third, our ed higher education system, something I know people here know a lot about. Our universities are the envy of the world. We're home to 17 of the top 20 research universities. By the way, that uh, assessment was done by a Chinese university. Our scientists publish uh, far more papers in prominent journals than any other country. And despite the, you, what you may hear, the fact is that we graduate more engineers per capita than either China or India. Foreign students compete to study at universities like this one. And last year, we enrolled a record 820,000 foreign students in U.S. universities. So the combination of our size, our wealth, these enduring uh, strengths that we have in innovation and in energy, our higher education system, all make us really an economy that's positioned to be dominant going into the, going into the future. But don't take my word for it. There's an, uh, an, an, an Omaha-based investor by the name of Warren Buffett who had the following to say in his latest shareholder letter. Quote, I've always considered a bet on ever-rising U.S. prosperity to be very close to a sure thing. Indeed, who has ever benefited during the past 237 years by betting against America? If you compare our country's present condition to that existing in 1776, you have to rub your eyes and wonder. 
and the dynamism embedded in our market economy will continue to work its magic. America's de best days lie ahead. I'm probably the first National Security Advisor to quote Warren Buffett, but uh, on, on, on the issue of the economy and our future, I think he has a lot of standing. Next, I want, I want to address our military. By any measure, our military is unmatched. That's not likely to change any time in the soon. In terms of sheer size, the U.S. military spends more each year on defense than the next 10 nations put together. Our defense budget is more than five times bigger than that of our nearest competitor, China, and despite that country's rapid military buildup. Even after 13 years of war, the longest period of continuous conflict our armed forces have ever seen, we remain capable of defeating any adversary. But frankly, these measurements understate our true advantages. Our Navy owns 11 of the world's 20 aircraft carriers, making us the only country on the Earth with a truly global power projection. With more than a decade of experience fighting terror, our special operations forces have become a unique American asset. Uh, the President mentioned this, the May 2011 raid on Osama bin Laden's compound in Abbottabad, Pakistan, over 7,000 miles away from the United States, was only the most visible example of how our battle-tested special operations uh, operators successfully execute complex missions in dangerous places ac across, the across the globe. No other nation has anything like the ability to project power with the precision that the United States can. And I experienced this very, very uh, directly for, for almost five years. And by historical measures, by the way, you know, this, this, these conversations about whether we have kind of uh, empire overstretch, uh, whether we're too stretched in terms of our expenditures, the current U.S. defense burden is not excessive of the share of GDP. With the Iraq war over, the war in Afghanistan winding down, our military now stands on a more sustainable footing with no sign of the kind of overstretch that some have worried about. We also possess a network, and this is not commented upon enough when you compare us to other countries. We possess a network of over formal 50 alliances, the largest in human history. For half a century, over half a century, on a bipartisan basis, the United States has built a global network of alliances around the world, in Asia and in Europe. Uh, and no other nation in the world can look to anything like this. These enduring partnerships, as I said, are a unique American strength, and we continue to depend on them, particularly in the Asia-Pacific region, but also given the events of the last uh, 60 or 90 days in Europe as well. Next, our geography. And this is one that's not commented upon enough, in my view, either. Our geography and resources are our most natural advantage. These enduring strengths are rarely discussed but they are provided for the safety and prosperity of the American people from the days the first settlers arrived here. We're an Atlantic and a Pacific power, an, Ameri an, an American and an Arctic nation. We are protected by oceans and peaceful borders. We live in a hemisphere of sta mostly stable democracies, and we enjoy friendly, productive relationships with our American states. The bottom line is this, the bottom line strategic point. The United States has not faced any real threat in its own hemisphere. In addition to our energy resources, we have other diverse and valuable sets of natural resources. We have the largest deposits of rare earth metals at a time when composition for those resources are on the rise, and we're the world's largest exporter. No other nation in the world, no other big power in the world has the same kind of blessed situation, geographic situation, and fertile land mass that the United States has. You look at our competitors around the world, we don't have disputed borders with, our, uh, with Canada or Mexico. We don't have any threats in our hemisphere, and we are, we are not a dependent power. We're not dependent on others for food, and energy and other resources to maintain our prosperity. Next, leads me to the fourth enduring strength I want to discuss today. And that one puts us in a position, and it's a structural strength to lead in the 21st century, our people. We're blessed to have a bright demographic future. Our workforce is relatively young and growing. Between now and 2050, the population of the United States will grow by more than 100 million people, expanding our workforce by 40%. This is not the case elsewhere in the world. This is not the case with respect to our peer competitors around the world. The populations of other developed nations in Western Europe, Japan, South Korea are aging and shrinking. By 2050, the median age in China will be 50. By 2050, the median age in the United States will be 40. A big part of the reason for our democratic profile, that our democratic profile looks better than the rest of the world, is we are a nation of immigrants. Immigrants are both younger, than the population at large and participate in the workforce in larger numbers. They are also a source of great creativity, and the United States has the distinct advantage over other developed nations when it comes to attracting highly skilled immigrants. Foreign entrepreneurs and scientists choose to make the United States their home because it's easier to enter our labor markets and move within them than in any other developed country. Our open society calls for, allows for more seamless integration than elsewhere. That's why, by the way, I think it's important for Congress to pass 
comprehensive immigration reform is it's not just a domestic issue, it really is a strategic issue about an advantage that we are going to have uh, in the competition uh, in the 21st century, a distinct demographic advantage. Finally, uh, the last asset that I want to talk about is our global leadership role. There is no other nation that can replace the United States with respect to this. For generations, Americans have taken up the mantle of leadership in a world torn by war and scarred by oppression. We've repeatedly put American blood and treasure on the line to defend our values and our advance, our human, advance universal rights. And the world still expects the United States to do this today. People everywhere look to America to protect global commerce, ensure the free flow, free flow of energy, and control the spread of dangerous weapons. Now, plenty of countries have leverage, but there's a qualitative difference, and you see that around the world. Like, the, the, the countries have leverage, particularly in their regions. But there's a big difference between leverage and leadership. We bring to bear more than just resources. We have an unmatched ability to convene countries and coordinate international efforts. That's because of the attractiveness of our ideas, our style of leadership, and the fact that we've nurtured such a successful international system. Former Mad Secretary of State Madeleine Albright calls America the indispensable nation. That's because few global problems can be solved without American involvement. Our allies in Europe, the Middle East, and Asia clamor for active U.S. engagement in these regions. The concern in the world is not the United States is overbearing and leaning in too much. The concern in the world is actually the United States might not lean in and lead enough. And that's a testament to the attractiveness of U.S. leadership. Although American power is occasionally resented, there is everywhere a strong attraction to our values of democracy, free markets, respect for human rights, and it's impossible to imagine any other country assuming the global leadership role that we currently play. Now, I told you I was going to give an optimistic speech, but I also think we need to be clear-eyed about the liability side of this balance sheet, which I described. And I just want to talk very briefly about five challenges that we have to address in the next decade. One, getting control of our long-term budget deficit is one of the first orders of business. Our fiscal position risks undermining our economic foundation. Now, despite the general impression out there, the fact is that over the last several years, our deficit has dropped precipitously. In fact, faster than any period since the demobilization after World War II. But in just two years, the deficit will begin rising again, driven mainly by, man by mandatory entitlement spending. As a result, we'll have less flexibility to make useful investments in the future of our country from science and technology to national defense. And taking on our deficits, economic growth should be continue to be our priority. My friend and former Treasury Secretary Larry Summers estimated that just an increase of one-fifth of one percent in annual economic growth would address the projected long-term budget gap. Second, infrastructure. Just five years ago, the World Economic Forum ranked American infrastructure seventh best in the world. Today, it's 15th. And U.S. public construction as a percentage of GDP has plummeted to its lowest point in 20 years. Our overburdened roads and bridges create a situation that is environmentally, politically, and economically unsustainable. Third, we can no longer take our advantage in innovation for granted. China and Japan have already surpassed just the number of patents filed each year. And China is quickly catching up in terms of R&D spending. That's why it is a critical national priority for our government to continue to, advance, to continue to invest in advancing scientific knowledge, especially in kind of basic research, which really has been the foundation of a number of the great innovations that we've seen in the last 25 years in the United States. And at the same time, our failure to overhaul immigration system blunts our natural edge in the global competition for talent. 40% of the people receiving advanced degrees in science, technology, engineering, in mathematics, American universities are foreign nationals that have no legal way to stay here and contribute, even if they chose to. And American business leaders regularly express frustration that our current laws make it hard for them, harder for them to hire individuals from abroad. We really do need change here. Similarly, we need a wake-up call with respect to primary and secondary education. Our universities are the best in the world, but we rank 17th on Peterson's well-regarded education index for grade school. That's unacceptable. And if we're going to prepare Americans for the jobs of the future and restore the American middle class, we have to re-out-educate re the uh, world. Now, overcoming these liabilities will take time and difficult choices. But here's the point I wanted to make on the challenges. Here's the key point. None of these challenges is insurmountable. None of them is some inherent or, or, or challenge that can't be addressed. Every one of them has a policy solution in sight that is feasible and affordable to our nation. And addressing them in each case is a matter of mustering political will, just as we've done the last 200 years. So with the worst of the economic crisis behind us, the war in Iraq over, the war in Afghanistan winding down, now is the time for smart choices and wise investments that will sustain American power and leadership for generations to come. That means taking all the necessary steps to enhance economic growth, 
ramping up our investment in science and technology, repairing our infrastructure, undertaking more thoroughgoing political reforms to help the, restore the health of our democracy. And as we continue to renew our nation, our fundamental strengths will propel us forward. Our open society and democratic institutions set us apart. Our military remains the strongest in the world. We will continue to lead on the international stage. Our institutions allow us to pursue the kind of just and sustainable growth our changed society needs. And we are younger than our competitors and our economy will continue to be more vibrant. I was reminded a few years back uh, during my time in the White House when I called Henry Kissinger, who I talked about at the outset of this talk, and I asked him what he made of all the renewed talk about American decline, and I'll never forget his reply. He said, well, Tom, let me ask you this. Is there any other country you'd rather be national security advisor for? And the answer is self-evidence, of course not. Our power goes beyond a snapshot of individual metrics. Above all, it lies in the ability of our society and time and time again to meet problems head on. The next century of American power is within our reach, if we challenge ourselves, especially our young people, to meet it. Thanks for your attention. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Well, thank you. We do have time for a couple questions. So if anybody has questions, please uh, go to the microphones on the right and left side. and. Uh, Any questions besides students leaving okay. to go to class? Yes, okay. sir. Am I good? Yes. So in terms of the budgetary problems that you talk about, how much breathing room do you believe the U.S. military has to make cuts into the future? Well, I think that the, the United States military budgets are going to be decreased in the, in the, in the coming few years and, and should after coming out of, again, a long period of war. I think we need to be careful, though. Uh, and I think that the, you know, the current path we're on, that the administration's budget is on right now, has a decrease in... Uh, and uh, uh, the amount of money spent. But it also has done, I think, a pretty good job of allocating the remaining, the resource we have in a strategic way to meet the challenges that we have going forward. I think we can certainly afford the military uh, challenges that we have in front of us, but I would, I would caution. I don't think we should go any much deeper than we've gone with respect to the projections going forward, frankly. Um, I think that would be a mistake. Uh, the United States has global responsibilities, and we see it every day around the world. Uh, and, uh, the United States has uh, the ability to meet these challenges, uh, and a withdrawal by the United States in terms of uh, the role that we played would be a mistake. It would be a mistake for us and a mistake for the world going forward. There really isn't anyone to replace. So the bottom line to answer your question directly is, I think that we're on a reasonable path to decrease the military budgets, and they should after a period of war. Uh, the military has said that they can keep, uh, we can meet our commitments on the path that we're on, but if we go further, I think we would be in trouble. Thank you. Would you comment on the current Ukrainian-Russian uh, crisis yeah. and Putin's aggressive uh, stances? He seems to be ratcheting up uh, to see how far he can push the West and the United States. Yeah. This is an important moment for, US, for, for, for the United States and the West uh, today. Um, Putin is a, is, a, is a leader for whom concepts like balance of power, sphere of influence, Zero-sum outcomes are very real concepts uh, and drive a lot of what he's about. He has decided to uh, design a Russian foreign policy whose principal aspect or characteristic is opposition to the West and the United States. It's essentially kind of a negative proposition that Russia will stand in opposition. Uh, he, third, uh, has really not been pursuing, has really kind of gone in a different direction, uh, the policies that were really the policies of Yeltsin and, leader, and the leadership after the fall of the Soviet Union of integrating with the West. Uh, as I said, his foreign policy is to push away and to stand kind of distinct from the, uh, uh, distinct from the West. I think with respect to Ukraine, what happened is that uh, with the fall of the government there, who were Russian supporters, uh, he saw that, in fact, that Ukraine, which they regard as an important part of the Russian sphere of influence, was, gonna, was, was slipping away. And he moved in Crimea to try to get some leverage back and to try to insert the Russia uh, into the conversation with respect to the future of Ukraine. My own judgment is that what uh, the, the Putin government is about in Ukraine is to try to continue to destabilize the situation. I think they'd rather have a Ukraine that's failing and destabilizing, destabilized than a Ukraine that is stable and succeeding that's oriented to the West. And I think that they will continue to put pressure on the Ukraine government uh, in order to try to keep it uh, uh, to keep it destabilized so that over, over time they can, reassert, uh, they can reassert some measure of leverage there and can prevent Ukraine from orienting to the West. 
I think that means that the United States uh, needs to do a number of things. Number one, uh, to support the new Ukraine government politically, and uh, Vice President Biden's actually going there next week to underscore that. Second is to do everything that we can with the international economic institutions to support the Ukrainian government financially, because they're going to be under pressure from the Russians. The Russians have a lot of leverage, given their historical economic relationships in Ukraine, to support the Ukrainians uh, economically. Third, I do think it's important for us uh, to uh, uh, respond in terms of putting pressure on Putin uh, and raising the cost, frankly, of the, uh, what's going on here. This, by the way, in Crimea and in Ukraine right now, this is essentially a, Russian, a set of Russian covert operations. That was what happened in Crimea. It had all the elements of a classic, of a classic covert operation. You had forces there who were, went in and they denied that they were Russian forces. You had an information warfare campaign where they took down the Crimean uh, media and put in place Russian media. And you had a political action effort, which was the referendum they ran there. And so they're trying to, uh, I think, do the same kinds of operations in, uh, in eastern Ukraine, again, to destabilize the situation. So the cost has to be risen, has to be increased. And I think this. Putin can step aside, right, and, and defiantly say that we're not going to be part of this uh, Western political system, uh, that we're going to define ourselves in opposition to that. But an integrated, but a large economy like the Russian economy cannot step back from the global economy. Uh, there's a lot of leverage that the West has with respect to the, to the Russian economy, and we should use that leverage, frankly, uh, to put pressure on him. And last, I think we need to uh, continue, two other things, to continue to support our NATO allies uh, and indicate our absolute commitment to meet our obligations to our NATO allies, to, to draw lump, some lines here. And last, to continue to try to seek a political solution if possible, and there's a, there are meetings coming up in the next few days with respect to that. Uh, but it's a, it's, a, it's a real leadership challenge here, uh, and we're facing a guy who has a, has a very different worldview here and is prepared to, is prepared to act to, 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 uh, uh, to, to see his worldview uh, uh, implemented. If I may follow up. Yeah. Do you do you see anything in terms of going one step too far if it spins out of control with the Russians in the eastern Ukraine uh, going into revolt, armed conflict, and the Ru will Russia feel compelled to step in militarily? Yeah, at this point, I don't, think, I don't think we know the answer to that question. I think what's happened here is, is that the, the Russians have organized pressure in the eastern part of Ukraine, and it could either provide a pretext for them to take additional action or to pr provide the base on which they would continue to destabilize the place. I don't know at this point which of those it is, but it could provide the pretext for, for action. And if it does, that's a very bad outcome because it would be, be a very, very bloody cir circumstance inside, inside, uh, inside Ukraine. And of course, in that case, I think you'd see Europe as well as the United States undertake very serious pressure measures on, uh, on Russia. I also think, by the way, that we should seriously consider providing um, uh, some level of military arms and support for the Ukrainian government. Sir, really, uh, really enjoy your comments today, and uh, thank you for coming. Uh, my question derives from the United States Army War College Guide to Strategy, which states that the foundation of a coherent national security strategy is based on the identification of ends, ways, and means. Yeah. And so the question I have is, what considerations did your national security strategy staff and future staffs, um, are they going to give the president's domestic agenda and his approval rating when developing the security strategy, and how did this affect ends, ways, and means? Yeah, I don't, well, a couple, a couple of points. First of all, I don't, I, uh, there were, I, you know, kind of directly political issues like the president's approval rating are not, are really not part of the kinds of considerations that go into the job that I had in terms of developing the nation's national security. But what does uh, have an important, uh, important elements in terms of the national security of the United States are, is our economic strength. Uh, and our economic program at home is an absolutely a critical piece of our national security, uh, as, uh, national security strategy going forward. And we regarded that from the first days that we came into office as absolutely essential. As I said in the talk, um, uh, there, is a, there, aren't, there aren't a lot of iron, iron laws in history, but one of them absolutely is that your ability to project power abroad, have military primacy and political primacy abroad is absolutely related to your economic strength. So we were in the White House and continue to be, I think, in the White House, very focused on economic strength as an absolute element of our, of our, uh, of our national security, of, uh, national security policy, and that was very important from a number, of, for a number of perspectives, uh, including, by the way, coming out of the Great Recession in 2008, which was, as I said in the talk, really a blow to U.S. power and prestige around the world that, with respect to the American system, if you will. Uh, and I think the way we're, that we're recovering, I think, is really uh, uh, absolutely critical in terms of uh, 
uh, how other countries view us around the world. And the fact that we are recovering uh, now and we are seen as really a principal source now of global economic growth is absolutely essential to our ability to um, lead, around the uh, lead around the world. Next. Uh, you mentioned in your speech that declinists point to the rise of China as yeah. something, and I'm kind of surprised you didn't talk more about that, but I guess I have two questions. Uh, do you see China's rise as something that's long-term or more temporary, and do you see China as growing, uh, as Chinese relations with the U.S. as growing more tense in the future? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's absolutely essential part of the uh, part of the analysis, and, we, and I did talk on a number of comparisons. Um, I think that, uh, as I said in the talk, that the United States kind of fundamental position is the strongest position of any country uh, in the world. Uh, because beyond just the kind of the raw economic numbers, and that's what people typically point to with respect to China, don't they? They point to kind of a straight line projection of what China's economic growth looks like going forward and what the size of the overall Chinese economy might be. There's a lot more to it than this, including, by the way, uh, the quality of leadership, alliances, and the other things that I uh, that I talked about, which I think put the United States in a very strong position to be the leading country in the world, as really as far as we can, as far as we can see. Point one. Point two. Uh, China's rise has been extraordinary. I mean, what's happened in China uh, in the last 30 years is the fastest social economic development in the history of the world. Ten times the pace of the Industrial Revolution. So what we've seen in China is an extraordinary historical event. Absolutely. Uh, and it's presented, uh, it's pre it presented a lot of good things in the world, including bringing hundreds of millions of people out of poverty. Third, we have built a pretty productive and constructive relationship with China. We now have a $500 billion a year trade relationship with China, for example, all manner of dialogue back and forth, uh, and we're not today in a hostile posture with respect to China at all. Next, though, is that there are political scientists, John Mersheimer at the University you know, of Chicago has just published a long piece on this, that argue the following, that there's an inherent... Uh, dynamic that develops between the existing power, in this case the United States, and a rising power, in this case China, that leads inevitably to conflict. That the, that the, that the rising power will seek to expand its power and that, the, and that the existing power will seek to maintain its power and that, a, and that a conflict is inevitable. I don't view, frankly, international relations as a subset of physics. Uh, but you do have to keep in, in mind those dynamics uh, going forward. And that's why engagement in a productive and constructive relationship, persistent engagement with China, I think is important. And most importantly, it's why the continued U.S. presence in Asia is critical. For the last 70 years, the presence by the United States in Asia has been the platform on which Asian econo the Asian economic miracle has been built. They haven't had the strategic rivalries and the conflicts that you would have expected because of the United States' presence. And so given China's rise, given the dynamics in the region, it's absolutely critical for the United States to maintain its presence in Asia. And that, I think, creating that atmosphere, that environment within which China rises is the best chance we have to avoid what the historians and the kind of the political determinists would see as inevitable conflict. Yeah. Hi. I'm going to move back in the United States. Um, my question is about involving Mr. Snowden and the NSA. Yeah. Um, your thoughts on net neutrality and how it, it affects our security in the United States and what the government is monitoring and how much and how well they need to monitor it. Yeah, okay. With respect to uh, Snowden, uh, the, the Snowden releases did tremendous damage to the United States. Uh, they did damage, he did damage from a number of perspectives. It damaged our relationships with certain countries around the world. Uh, it has damaged our companies, frankly, who are in the technological space, who have had difficulty in the world uh, with respect to selling one of the best products uh, in the world. Uh, it has really hurt the relationship between U.S. companies and the government, which in that relationship has been very important for a long time in terms of crime fighting and intelligence. So there's been real damage done by, and by the way, most of the disclosures by Snowden have had nothing to do with United States civil liberties. It had to do with programs that he alleged have been run, run outside the United States. Um, and that will cost the United States a lot in terms of having to uh, deal with the intelligence losses, uh, intelligence losses. So number one, it's been tremendously damaging. Number two, with respect to the, uh, the disclosures, there have been a lot of disclosures alleging certain capabilities that the United States has, but I don't know of a single disclosure about those capabilities being used in an abusive way to violate the civil rights of a single American. Uh, so uh, I think what that shows, frankly, is that there are in place checks and balances on these programs uh, uh, that I think have been fairly successful. 
Next, uh, the disclosures have caused a discussion to take place in the United States about the questions of do we have the right balance? Um, are, are a number of these programs necessary to continue going forward? Um, and are they worth it? And, and that conversation has taken place and the president put in place a commission to look at a number of those things and some changes have taken place with respect to some of these, with some of these programs where the, they, where the balance is kind of pushed back towards more protection of civil liberties uh, or a program wasn't seen as, seen as, as important as it might have been 10 years ago. Uh, and those questions are all useful uh, to ask. But I, I would underscore the following thing, though, as I said, that there's been a lot of discussion about these capabilities. And in fact, we ask our national security agency to develop these capabilities. The national security agency has its roots in cracking codes, right, and in protecting the country in terms of trying to figure out what, what the adversaries were saying uh, ahead of their taking action against the United States. And it's been absolutely critical to protecting the United States. Um, and I, don't, again, don't know uh, of any abuses that have been disclosed. This has been discussions about mainly capabilities and about whether we have the balance in the programs right. And those discussions are, are, are fine to have and there's some changes have been made. But my bottom line here is that uh, there, were a lot, there were a lot of other ways to do this rather than the way that, uh, that Snowden did this without doing the damage to the United States that he did. Hi, um, my question is given like that NATO's original purpose of containment is no longer as yeah. relevant and the recent debate over the future of NATO, what do you personally, what do you personally believe is the new like future of NATO mm -hmm. and especially in light of the recent crisis in the Crimea and countries such as the Ukraine yeah. actually looking to join NATO? Yeah, that's a great question. And, and uh, yeah, NATO has really been the principal way by which the United States has remained involved in the security of Europe. That's the first point. Uh, and it has, you know, since the fall of the Soviet Union, has really been critical to bringing the former Soviet, the, the members of the former Warsaw Pact, the Eastern Europe, Central Eastern European countries, into the West and given them a sense of security. And I think that what's come about now is that a kind of a renewed uh, sense that that's an important mission, uh, that countries who, are, who border Russia, right, and who have, you know, histories with Russia, really do look to NATO as a source of security. And I think that's going to be a lot of what NATO is going to be about in Europe going forward here, which is providing that security, which is provided for in the NATO Charter, which, which provides that the security of every country is the security of all. And I think that's absolutely, absolutely critical uh, going forward. So I think this has actually caused, uh, caused the Europeans and, other, and the United States really to look at uh, NATO kind of anew as an important and, uh, 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 security measure in, uh, in Europe. Now, one thing I would point out that, I think that I'm troubled about with respect to NATO, and that is the fact that the European countries have drastically reduced their defense budgets. Uh, and the United States is now carrying about 75% of the load on NATO expenditures. That's not sustainable going forward. I mean, you can't have an alliance where one country provides almost all the resources and the other countries are dependent on it. And the Europeans are going to have to look, I think, really at their defense expenditures, given that uh, you know, you do have a, Ru a Russia here with a leader who has indicated pretty aggressive intention. Uh, so, the, the, so the reassurance function of NATO is important, but I do think that the Europeans are going to have to look hard at the amount of money that they're willing to spend on supporting it. Thank you. Yeah. Well, we're going to take this question over here and the three people standing up over there, and that'll, that'll conclude our questions. Okay. So, yes, sir. Hello, my name is Eric Zeke. I'm a student here at K-State. Uh, my question for you would be, what are your views on the threat of cyber terrorism, yeah. especially as it relates to the financial industry? Mm -hmm. Well, I think that, you know, as, as, uh, okay, as, most of the, as, as most of our commerce and our life comes online, uh, that this is becoming obviously an increasing issue. Uh, and I think, I think it's going to be obviously an issue that's going to only be a bigger issue for us going forward. Uh, again, as you come online, more of your infrastructure, more of your economic life, more of your personal life is uh, vulnerable uh, to attacks online via cyber, uh, number one. Number two, there are a lot of different aspects to this. Uh, and I'll get to the financial side in a second. You know, there's, a, you know, there's, there's, there's pure espionage through cyber. There is uh, attacks or vulnerabilities of critical infrastructure. And on that score, I think that we, what we really do need to have is really kind of best practices and a lot more information sharing between the government and the private sector to protect our critical infrastructure. I don't think we're there. It's very uneven at this point. Uh, there's cyber crime, uh, kind of cyber hacking. Uh, and I think that really is a, that's going to be a challenge both for the government but for private industry uh, to live with going forward here. Uh, a lot of that is about basic cyber hygiene, by the way, kind of best practices that, the, that companies are going to have to really insist on uh, having every, uh, every day. 
Another threat is uh, cyber theft, cyber-enabled theft, and that is basically countries like China who come into the United States and steal really billions of dollars worth of intellectual property. Uh, so there are multiple threats, I think, that have to be, that have to, that have to be dealt with. On the financial side, I think uh, a couple things. One is that, again, I think companies now obviously realize that this is something they're going to have to live with. It's kind of the, the, the normal environment they're going to be in going forward. Uh, that uh, uh, their customers are going to expect them to have best practices. Uh, that there are going to be actions that could be taken against them, and they're going to have to be really resilient uh, in their ability to kind of to come back uh, and, and, uh, and deal with quickly these, uh, uh, these challenges. That there should be more information sharing allowed among companies about threats and best practices. That may require legislation so they don't have any trust immunity, uh, 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 cap um, vulnerability. Uh, and that it's beyond, the, it's probably beyond uh, the scope of any one company or companies, and the government's going to, I think, going to have to be increasingly involved as a partner. Those are my thoughts, my thoughts on it. But it's obviously a very big issue for the, for the country. My question is, how did you get your start both in foreign policy uh -huh. and in the White House? Well, I had kind of an unusual route towards being national security advisor. I started out in politics. Uh, so I came into the Carter White House right after I graduated from college and ended up on the uh, political side of the uh, political side of the operation. I managed the convention in 1980, Madison Square Garden, uh, for President Carter. I remember going there uh, to New York to do the planning for the convention in 1979. I was, what, I was 24 years old, and I was with Hamilton Jordan, who was the who was the White House Chief of Staff at the time uh, for President Carter, and we get out of the car downtown, we're going to see some political guys, and we were, we were early, and Hamilton said, let's go, get a, let's go get a cup of coffee. I said, okay. And I'm like this. And he said, well, come on, let's go, let's go. What's the matter with you? I said, I said I've never been to New York before. So, <laughs> so, uh, so that's how I got started. I managed the convention in, 19, uh, in 1980 for President Carter. I managed the convention for, uh, for Vice President Mondale in San Francisco in 1984. And then uh, I had a mentor uh, uh, named Warren Christopher, who was Secretary of State for President Clinton. He ended up being my law partner and my mentor, and really was the person who kind of turned me from politics to national security. So starting in the mid-1980s, I just spent a tremendous amount of time really through self-teaching kind of, kind of self and becoming involved in programs and task forces and uh, uh, national security-related entities uh, for the next, you know, whatever it's been now, the next for the 20 years after that. Uh, and then turned towards the national security side. I came into the Clinton and the Obama administrations through a, a specific route. I prepared uh, President Clinton for his debates in 1992 against uh, Bush 40, President Bush 41 and Ross Perot. Uh, and in 2008, I led the pre debate preparation effort for President, then Senator Obama against Senator McCain. Uh, and though that's a combination, if you will, of kind of political and policy, uh, policy skills, but that's kind of a unique, kind of a, that was, so I kind of had a unique uh, a unique path here. I've been very, very lucky. Uh, I started in the White House in June of 1977 and um, really, really loved every minute of it. Thank you. Yeah. Hello. Uh, my question is, given the leverage that Russia has as an oil provider to uh, Western Europe, yeah. what do you believe will be the effect and the effectiveness of sanctions imposed by European Union nations upon Russia to deter Russian militarism. Yeah. I do think that the, that, the, that the West has tremendous leverage and kind of asymmetric leverage, if you will. Uh, Russia is a country with large companies, particularly in the commodities areas that you're referencing in oil and gas. They need access to the, to the international uh, financial markets. Uh, Russia also has an economy that's deeply dependent on oil and gas. And it's had an economy that's got an economy that's, very, that's slowed down substantially in the last, in the last year and I think is vulnerable to a set of, a set of sanctions. Now, uh, there are two sides to the uh, energy economic equation between Russia and Europe. Russia provides about a third of the energy to Europe, which you were referencing. Uh, but if Russia cuts off that uh, sale and transfer of energy, oil and gas, to Europe, Russia loses the income. Uh, so these, 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 these transactions are beneficial because they're two-sided. Uh, and that's a big decision for Russia, frankly, I think, to, to go that far. We're also coming into the spring and the summer uh, where there's less vulnerability. I think one thing that's important as a result of all this Ukraine, this Ukraine incident is that it really has focused the Europeans very intensely on diversifying their energy resources and in developing their own. Uh, so developing the infrastructure to get oil and gas from other places in the world and really taking a look, a harder look than they've taken at the, uh, 
at developing their own resources like natural gas and, and, uh, and uh, shale gas, which I, think they're, which, I think they're, which I think they're doing. So there's been an incentive here now for the Europeans to look longer term, that's a longer term project, to reduce their vulnerability to single suppliers like Russia. But uh, I think it's important to keep in mind that a threat by Russia to cut off uh, gas and oil to Europe comes with a, with a price, and the price is they don't get paid. Uh, so I, I continue to think that Russia is quite vulnerable to a, to a tough set of sanctions going forward here, and I think that's the leverage we're going to have. Thank you. Yeah. Last question. Um, I was wondering, uh, you've already discussed the cyber and economic threats, but yeah. I was wondering besides that, what do you consider the biggest uh, threats or hazards to the American people and to government? Yeah, it's a good question. I mean, the, the uh, first is that a, a, a really a, a really determined focus on our economic recovery is absolutely critical. Uh, I don't think this is going to happen because I think we have reached a point where we're moving out of the recession, but any fallback in terms of economic growth would be, a, would be really damaging to our ability to project power around the world. That's the, the first point. Uh, second uh, is that, you know, we have, as you pointed out, uh, we have a, a, a cyber threats which need a lot more investment and focus and are getting those, frankly, in the government and in private business as we talked about earlier. Third, we continue to have a terrorism threat to the United States. Now, it's devolved. Uh, we have taken very aggressive actions against core al-Qaeda in South Asia uh, and in Yemen and, and elsewhere uh, and really, really, uh, uh, really punished that organization and reduced its ability to attack the United States. But we're now in a different phase of the terrorism threat and the al-Qaeda group has morphed and has moved around in different kind of formulations around the world, particularly in North Africa and in the Middle East, and we need to keep a careful watch on these organizations. They don't at this point present homeland threats, but could over, over time. Uh, we have the threat inside the United States of, uh, of lone wolves, if you will, who have become radicalized and can engage in terrorism. And these are all important things for us to keep our eye on. And today's the anniversary of the Boston Marathon bombing, uh, actually. Um, but you know, at the end of the day, uh, and you ask a good question, we don't focus on it enough. Uh, at the end of the day, uh, you know, the, the one threat uh, that could really threaten us in a fundamental way, because we are largely, we're a very secure country. Uh, um, we have a lot of challenges, you know, Ukraine is a challenge, we have challenges potentially in Asia, we have terrorism, cyber terrorism, challenges that we have to deal with. But one that could really threaten us fundamentally is uh, a nuclear weapon exploding in the United States. Uh, and so I advocate very strongly our continued effort to lock down nuclear materials around the world and to keep a really kind of a laser focus on the threat of nuclear terrorism because that's the kind of event. Uh, we have these, you have terrible events uh, that, we, that we have faced and we have to manage, but that's the kind of event that could be kind of a fundamental change uh, in our security, in the security of the United States and our future, and one that I encourage everybody I talk to to remain really focused on locking down these nuclear materials uh, and protecting the country from nuclear terrorism. A diplomatic piece of this, which is underway right now, is the effort to work with Iran to get Iran to stand down from pursuing a nuclear weapon uh, and to give confidence to the world that is not pursuing a nuclear weapon. Why is that important? That's important because if Iran pursues a nuclear weapon, we would have a terrible proliferation of nuclear states on our hands, I fear, uh, and that would really complicate our ability to protect ourselves from, uh, from the nuclear threat. So bottom line, I think that is the principal long-term severe threat we face in addition to the others that we th that you mentioned. Thank you. Okay. Folks, please join me in thanking yeah. Mr. Donnellan for a great lecture. Okay. Okay.